on the last section here, and um, uh, quite excited to introduce uh, my brother David, who's been a, a fan of building this notion of a sales and marketing machine for some time, and really has taken what many people used to think of as an art and created a science out of it. And I think it's so helpful to hear from him why this is possible, because it's not just about size. It's back to that thought that uh, Brian just articulated so well, which is if you use your brain early on, you actually really can turn this into a science. So David, great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, so one of the things that I want to do is a little bit um, covered by Mike, but I'm going to um, cover it again in a slightly different way for you here. So. If we think about what the basic of a funnel is here, um, I think it's really straightforward. You take a bunch of suspects and you put them through a bunch of stages and you hope to get somebody that's a closed deal. And once you've got a closed deal, you then want to do the reverse part of that, which is to try to expand that so you get the entire usage, uh, potentially get some upsell uh, in that process there. And so an interesting thing here is if, if we were in a perfect world for all of you as marketers, you would be able to get all of that done in one single step. And how many of you would like it if we could put up a website which looked like this, where we put up a small video of our product and told you that it cost $9,999 and said, buy it now. So the interesting question here is, why does this not work? Can you ask, answer that question for your own particular products? If I can grab somebody in the audience who's got a specific startup and a product here to tell this audience here why this would not work for their product. Yeah. <laughs> Because you're not, you're not targeting the buyer, you're not, you're not targeting the, the market, a, a specific enough segment to answer their, their question. You're right, but imagine for two seconds here that you have got the right buyer um, who's targeted on the site. What stops them from feeling comfortable to click the button there, right then and there? Go ahead. They see the price before I see the video and how the product is. So they're worried about the price. They're not sure if they're going to get a return on investment on the money. Would be one. Price can scare them for see what is the product. Trust, like how do they know that they can trust your product? Trust is a fantastic word. That was very well done. Thank you very much. So they're very concerned about can they trust you and can they trust your product to actually work would be a key one. Yep. There are multiple stakeholders. Who's going to make the decision to buy and not to buy? Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very good one. Yep. People usually want to dig deeper, and I don't. There's nothing else for you to do on this page, so there you can play the video again, but the same kind of information. So why why do they want to dig deeper? What what information do they need to find that they're looking to dig deeper for? It could be credibility. It could be, but I think people in the purchase decision making process they need multiple cycles of confirmation until they reach the point that they're confident that, that this is going to be useful for them at that price point. Okay, so uh, let me. You're dead right, but the thing that I'm, I'm trying to get you to do is to tell me exactly what they're looking for when they do that digging. So you have clarity in your mind about precisely what questions they feel they need to have answered before they're going to be comfortable to actually buy your product. Do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. The affirmation from other customers. Perhaps? Affirmation from other customers. Why do they want affirmation from other customers? What are they trying to solve there? Is, is this some human emotion that you can think of that that's going to make them feel better about? Yeah, they want to be in and with whatever is, you know. And what about fear of failure? Do you think they might have a fear of failure? Yeah, I think that's one of the big ones is that the, the, the looking at other customers takes away some of that fear from them, yeah. Yeah, and if social proof, if it, in addition to that, also makes them not have to make decisions themselves. You see that a lot of people with similar needs have succeeded, then they can short circuit their evaluation of it and say, okay, it's likely to succeed for me as well. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, recognition there. Yeah. One last one at the back. How it can help them out in solving their problems. Yes, exactly. Is this actually going to solve my problem as opposed to is it merely going to be some cool thing where I can watch some cool video? So what I was trying to do there was pretty simple, which is I'm trying to get you to step out of the way you think about the world and put yourself into your customer's brain to try to understand what's going on in their brain when they are asked to buy your product. And if I can recommend this to you, I would strongly suggest writing down every one of these points particularly for your product, yes. So it might be things like, is it going to integrate with salesforce.com? <coughs> um, are my people going to be able to actually work this? Is there a good return on investment? 
Um, but fear is one of the greatest things that you've got to overcome. Fear of failure, fear of, of themselves looking like idiots because they brought something into their company that, that didn't work uh, and overcoming that. So that's one of the key things that we want to have is that list of things that have to be satisfied before somebody will buy your product. And to me, uh, the art of marketing is really figuring out how to take what should have been that one step with the instant buy button and designing the series of steps that will allow you to effectively accomplish answering each one of those questions for them. So um, when we think about trying to design these steps here, Michael already covered this for you. I have a much simpler buying cycle than him. I think his is excellent. Uh, mine just has three stages in it, awareness, consideration, and um, purchase. Let me give you a little example of, of what we're thinking about here. How many of you have gone, um, let's say you're going to pick up your kid from school, and actually I don't think anybody in this room has kids, so it's probably not applicable, but you've been wandering around town waiting for a train, and you wandered into a store without any intention to purchase, and within five seconds of getting in the door, a salesperson <coughs> came rushing up to you and started trying to convince you that these sweaters here would look fabulous on you, and you really should consider buying them, and won't leave you alone, and all you really wanted to do was wander around the store. Can anybody tell me how do they feel when that experience happens to them? <laughs> it's not fun, is it? Right, it's not an enjoyable experience to be sold to. So that's a really interesting thing here. The more I ask people about this, the more clear it becomes that people really don't like to be sold to. But let me give you a different example. You are out at lunch, you accidentally spill your coffee over your sweater, you're now in a terrible state, you've got to go to an important meeting, you run into a store, you desperately need another sweater, you can't find a salesperson anywhere. Th very irritating, right? So what's different? One, you didn't want the salesperson, and the other one, you did want the salesperson. Anybody have an answer as to why they're different? They are in need. They are in need of uh, the salesperson, the need that you're right, they have a need. Um, the thing that I believe is really the key is that, is that in the one, they're actually very early in the buying cycle. They don't even have awareness of what they're trying to buy. In the other one, they're really far down the purchase cycle, and they know exactly what they want to buy. And the mistake that I think most marketers make is thinking that every single person who comes to their, their website and that they meet is actually immediately ready to buy, so they need to jump straight into selling to them. And they turn them off with this amazingly aggressive pitch to them and it's really the wrong approach. And my personal guess is that 80% of the people who come to your website aren't ready to buy, and really you have to do something else to engage them and build a careful and quiet relationship with them and just hope that you are around at the time when they do actually find that they have that need and are ready to buy it. And that's something which I think most marketers make a terrible mistake of and, and um, try to sell too quickly. So the other thing that's really interesting here is the concept of triggers in the buying cycle. There are, for an awful lot of products like an antivirus product, it's very hard to sell somebody that until they've actually had a virus or until they've read an article that scared them about a virus. Or maybe in the case of backup software, have you, it's hard to sell backup software to people that haven't actually suffered a loss. There's not the motivation there. So there are triggers that happen. And I'd ask you to think about uh, the triggers that specifically cause your buyers to actually figure out they need your product. And the thing I'm going to show you in a while here is, as a marketer, can you cause that trigger to happen? That's a very powerful thing if you can, because if, you, if you're able to make that happen, you can move them out of a very simple interest stage and actually into the point where they have need and want to, want to uh, move forward here. What is the, the things that you do at the two different stages of the funnel, the top of the funnel stage? Top of the funnel is really very simple, which is this is when you're dealing with a customer who's, who on the farthest left-hand side has no idea that they have a need for your product and on the farthest right-hand side, it's very clear that they have an exact need for your product. And there's a spectrum of gray and white in between that. And there's different activities that you would take. But my key thing that I want to get across to you here is that when you finish the top of the funnel, what you want to be doing, I believe, is driving them to your website. And when you get them to your website, you want to get their email address from them. Because if you don't have their email address or some other connection with them, you cannot continue to stay in touch with them and continue to, to uh, uh, build a relationship with them there. So once you've gone through that stage there, you'll go into the next phase, which I think is the, the middle of the funnel. And the middle of the funnel is pretty straightforward. It's really about determining which people are actually ready to buy and putting attention and focus on them with the qualification phase. And those who are not, you stick into a big lead nurturing bucket and <clears throat> you want software like HubSpot to help you run this. And basically the art of doing great lead nurturing 
is to get very good at segmenting your customers down because the open rates on emails that are generic and broad across the whole base will be very low. But if you can pick people that are in very specific verticals and send them an email saying, I know you're a photography company, here's how we solve problems for photographers, that does very well. And similarly, for example, if you've got somebody who's doing a free trial of your product, and you know by using um, ex uh, tracking of which things they've used and which things they haven't used, that they've used this feature but not that feature, you want to send them an email which says, hey, I see you've experienced this part of our product, but I would like to encourage you to, to look at this, and here's a video which shows you the benefits of that, and here's how to get into it. So that's about where they are in the usage of your product, where they are in the sales cycle. So being able to segment, building up a database um, that shows you not only the attributes of the person, but also all of the things that they've done. Have they been to your website? Were they on the page where, for example, the pricing is, the pricing page is a good indicator that, for example, they're ready to buy. Were they on the technical pages? That tells you that they're a technical buyer. Were they on the pages that have got all the customer testimonials? That probably tells you they're a business buyer. So you treat them differently, send them different emails based on that kind of information there. If you get to this um, uh, point here of having a funnel set up, one of the key things that we will have done is created a series of steps, each step uh, will actually be trying to address one of these questions that they, they had to have addressed when you were um, asking the question of why they didn't buy with the single uh, page website there. So what we want to do is uh, for the metrics here, I'm just going to give you a very simple concept of how to design your metrics for a funnel. You're going to measure how many people were in each step and also uh, when you finished that step, how many people converted to the next step? Michael was 100% right. One of the key things that I discover when I walk into most companies is that they haven't connected their activities together. So they didn't make a link between the webinar that they held and what they want to do next. Um, so we are, I assume here, designing a completely linked series of actions. So when they come out of one, they're going to go straight into the next. And you want to measure how many actually did convert there. So let's take a very simple funnel and show you what that might look like. Assuming here that we've got visitors coming to a website and we want to convert those into a trial. And out of the trial, we're hoping that they're going to convert into a closed deal. So in that particular case, what we want is how many visitors have we got and we want a trend line so showing us that hopefully that's going up and to the right. A trend line of how many trials we've got, again hopefully going up and to the right. And a trend line of how many closed deals. And then we want the conversion rate from visitors to trials and the conversion rate from uh, trials to close deals. So that's the pretty simple way to tell you how to design your metrics for your funnel. And this um, is one last thing here is you want the overall conversion rate. And the reason for this is that different lead sources have very different conversion rates. So your Facebook ads, for example, might be completely different to your inbound marketing leads. And you need to know that because some of them are going to be good investments and, and uh, give you a good payback and others won't. So these metrics will help tell you wh which is working and which is not working. Now, once you've got these metrics in place, you will find that every funnel, even Cisco, Microsoft, Oracle, etc., have blockage points where their funnels aren't working the way that they hope they will do. All right, so I found I spend a lot of time and have a ton of fun going around in companies and talking to them about their blockage points. I spent three hours with one of my portfolio companies doing that just before I came here. And what I've discovered is that the, the key thing is you want your customers to do something. You designed your funnel the way you wanted it to work. And the customers are not motivated to do what you wanted them to do. So the step you're asking them for, the classic step everybody wants is you want them to come to your website. Well, they don't really have a reason why they want to come to your website. You've got to give them a good reason why they want to come to your website. Once you've got them to the website, you want their email address. How many of you like giving email addresses to websites? This man's shaking his head aggressively here. I think most of you feel the same way. Why? You're worried about getting spam, right? You hate getting spam email. So what we're looking at here, um, maybe give you an example of an uh, investment that I made a long time ago. Any of you heard of a company called JBoss at all? A few of you have, yeah? It's an open source Java application server. And they had, uh, when I first ran into them, um, uh, had not five million downloads of this take place. And when, when I went with them, they had a business selling documentation for $27,000 a month, and they were also selling training for it. So they were making a couple of hundred thousand dollars a quarter with this business. And they had a new idea about selling support contracts. 
And I was brought in to kind of look at how do we market this? What do we do to create these steps here? So the first thing I said to them is, where are the names of the five million people that downloaded this thing? Because we want to talk to them. And they told me that they tried putting an email form in front of that download, and it had cut the download rate by a factor of 10. So that really clearly brings out, you know, nobody wants to give their email address there. So what we did was pretty simple. This is the uh, thing that Michael's talked about a little bit, but I have a slightly different way of describing it. We looked at, um, on this blockage point here, there are two key elements that stop people from doing things. One of them is friction, and the second one is what are their concerns. And what we have to do as marketers is come up with a really super strong motivation that is more powerful than the resistance that they have, the friction that they have, and the concerns that they have. We've got to answer their concerns as well. Sometimes it's just a matter of telling them that you're not going to spam them and giving them some assurance that they won't have problems. But the art here is, is getting inside of the customer's head and understanding what's going on in their brain and recognizing other things about them. So a little example here is if you want somebody to come to your website and you don't want to annoy them straight away with selling, you need to attract them there with something interesting to them. And so the answer to that is get inside of their heads, understand the things like what does their boss expect of them at the end of every quarter? How do they get graded for good marks if their boss thinks they've done a great job? Or what do they, what do they personally worry about most? And maybe use those things uh, that are inside of their brain, not your brain, as to what you want to have happen to create the incentives for them here. So I'm going to uh, quickly illustrate what we did with JBoss. It was pretty straightforward. We took the documentation that they were selling for $27,000 after three months of arguing with them to give it away free, they finally gave it away free, and it turned on a lead flow of 10,000 leads per month for them, which uh, created another problem, which is that's too many leads for most salespeople to handle, but at least it was a, a huge start, and this basically fueled the whole business uh, from that point onwards there. So the documentation was an adequate motivation to overcome the concern about spam there. Let's have a look at another really good one here, which is getting traffic to your website. And here I'm gonna use uh, Brian as an example this is the predecessor to what currently exists, which is Marketing Grader. Um, HubSpot put up this, this site called Website Grader, and it's very cool because all you have to do is literally put in your URL for your company name, and then if you want to, put in the competitor's names, and then this thing would run away for a short while, and it would spit out an analysis of why your site was good or not good at search engine optimization. And the other clever thing about it is it would put a score there. Now, I have to say that my, my website, which is what was graded here, got 95, but almost nobody gets 95. The typical score is about 50 to 55 or so. And <clears throat> let's go through why does this work. Well, the first thing that's really interesting about this is this is a free application that gives you a lot of value. So because it's free, you spread it virally. You tell other people about the thing, and it gets an, an awful lot of interest from, from your friends as well. The second thing that's cool about this is it starts to um, present the fact that you're an expert in your field. So trust, somebody mentioned trust was very important before you buy from somebody. Within seconds flat, this has started to create trust that HubSpot is a company that knows what it's talking about. And then the other thing that I love about this is the score is actually a trigger. Because if you're like most Americans and you get a score of 55, you want to improve it. So the first question going through your mind is, well, what step next should I take to get a better score? And by the way, I think this concept is very usable in almost all businesses, which is you can grade a lot of the things that you're selling. You can tell the customer, you're not up to speed with the best practices in your particular industry, and here's why. And that is an inspiration to cause them to feel like they need to do something about it, particularly if they feel like there's a chance their boss might find out that they haven't got the best score around and that that might be a, a problem for them later on then. So in essence, the quick lessons from that, um, low customer work, high value, score leverages the uh, trigger, uh, builds trust through a clear demonstration of expertise. The last thing that I love about this is that this is a notion of using engineering for marketing. And I really think this is an incredibly potent thing for many of you because a lot of you have developers in your organizations and developers can build much more valuable things that cause an attraction for customers than marketers can. Marketers are stuck with things like white papers and, uh, and videos and stuff like that. So worth thinking about when you're considering this is, is bring your engineering team in on this problem and have them consider it as well.
So the art of doing this well <coughs> is to um, even go down to micro steps. A little tiny example I'll give you here. I was sitting with a company called Fetch Notes. That's a textiles company. And I like the entrepreneur there a lot, so I was telling him, you know, to, to give me the diagram of his viral loop that he was trying to create. And the first thing he said was, okay, so somebody downloads this app. Um, by the way, Fetch Notes is just a simple to-do list app on your, on your iPhone. You first thing you get them to do is put in a to-do list item, but his problem is that he wants you to use some special features in his product, which is to tag that to-do list item. And the issue there immediately with that very first step is most people are not used to tagging their to-do list items, and they don't really see why they should because there's no benefit apparent to them yet. So my thought for him on that one was, well, your friction is that there's, they don't know they don't know how to do it, and they don't know why they should do it. So what you need to do is put in-app um, messaging so that you can pick up on the fact that they've entered a to-do list item but not entered a tag and put up a little message which says, here's why you should tag and here's what the benefits are. And once they've done the, a couple of entries, then you want to show them the next thing, which is when they get the wow moment, which is to click on a filtered list of to-do list items, which is get me my work phone calls, which is two tags, work tag and a, a phone calls tag. And that's the moment when the customer gets the wow moment where they're excited about this product and suddenly see some benefit from it. So what we're doing there is we're microanalyzing each step of your trial, breaking them down, looking at the friction for them, looking at why there's a motivation for somebody to go to the next stage, why there's a problem for them to go to the next stage, and also particularly looking at when do they get the real moment of realization that this trial was successful? What did it need to take for me to feel like this was a successful trial. I will now continue to use this product and recommend it to others then. So that's my real, my real pitch to you here is map out your process from start to finish. Take that one website where people would have purchased in one thing, figure out the series of mini steps, and for each mini step, connect them to the next mini step, and sit and analyze what the friction is and the concerns are. Write those down. And the moment you write them down, this is a funny thing, I've, I've gotten a lot of people to solve the problem the second they put these things down because they immediately realize, ah, we could do that to solve that issue. Or we could make that a lot easier if we simply, but they're carrying them around in their head and they think they've done the best they can do. But the moment I make them write them down, magic happens. So there's the, the short amount that I can get covered in this amount of time here. And thanks so much for your time and attention. Thanks so much, David. One of the things that's exciting is to hear that being thought about in a way that I think everybody could approach those various different steps. And uh, I love this last point because um, I guess we must be brothers because we think similarly here on this one. But this is exactly what we were talking about when we did the slippery products analysis, which is how do you make the product simple, low cost, initial, prove value quickly, et cetera, all those other steps. And I couldn't agree more. It's an easy way for startups to make a big impact in the, the go to market. So great stuff. There are a lot of great slides that David didn't have a chance to cover. Um, so I'm going to encourage two things. One is, uh, first of all, these are all up on the site, uh, but also he has a great site, a great blog called forentrepreneurs.com, which I encourage you to visit. It has a lot of other great materials on this whole subject. Thanks again. And that gives me a great uh, chance to introduce our guest speaker tonight, which is Brian Halligan, who pretty much defined this whole term of inbound marketing. So welcome, Brian. Happy to have you with us. How's everybody doing? Everybody stand up. I have ADD, and I'm like a caged lion over there. Put your hands over your head. OK, stick your right out and do a little shake. <laughs> Left out, do a little shake. Sit back down. Nice job, team. OK, who's heard of HubSpot? OK, cool. Uh, so we got a crowd that sort of gets it. So this, this idea of inbound marketing, I, I really like this idea a lot. It's a new type of marketing. And um, there's sort of two observations behind it. And the first one's driven, dri driven um, here. Anyone know who this handsome guy is on the left? Famous guy. Come on, you're Harvard Business School here. That's my dad. <laughs> and that's me on the right. 
And if I just, I just, the, the first observation that, that led me to this idea of inbound marketing is just this radical transformation in how humans live and shop and learn. There's been this, ta uh, this sort of tear in the fabric of the universe around the way work happens. The way we all live and shop and learn has radically changed. And I think that the difference is shown with my dad. I think about my dad, he got a lot of mail. Every night he'd come home at 6 o'clock, I'd sit next to him on the bench, and he would have the scotch and water and have a little cheese with, with crackers, and he would open like all this mail and read it. I never open my, do you guys ever open your mail? There's never anything in there that's useful. He, he, we got seven TV stations, channel two, channel four, five, seven, 38, 56. And if you get the rabbit ears just right, you can get channel 68. Um, and he talked on the phone a lot and just very different from all of us. You know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Gmail. It's just a radically different way I work and live and shop and learn. Uh, so that's sort of my first observation I sort of came up with. My, my second observation is that the playbook that marketers use, almost all marketers use this, um, is pretty common. I, and the playbook is we're going to buy a list of email addresses and we're going you know, to bang people over the head on email. We're going to hire a bunch of young and hungry telesales reps and we're going to cold call people. We're going to spend a bunch of money on uh, advertising on Google AdWords or whatever it would be. We're going to hire a PR firm to interrupt journalists. Uh, we're going to do TV ads. We're going to do radio ads. That's sort of the marketing playbook. And that playbook worked great for my whole career. I sort of built my career on that. I call it the outbound marketing playbook. There's only one problem with that playbook. What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? With that, with that playbook. I mean, it's the opposite of what you guys do. I know, but what's the problem? <laughs> You're reaching a lot of people who don't want to hear your message. People are sick and tired of being marketed to, and they're sick and tired of being sold to, and they get really good at blocking it out, whether that's a DVR at home, or it's caller ID on your phone blocking the goddamn sales reps out. Um, whether it's um, you've got uh, you, you, you've got ad blocker software now that'll block out the Google AdWords that doesn't work as well. You've got uh, spam protection software and you've got uh, priority inbox with your Gmail. It's nearly impossible to reach somebody with the traditional marketing playbook today. You need to take that everything you learned in your marketing class here at HBS, throw it away. Doesn't work anymore. Completely rethink marketing to match the way humans actually shop and learn today. And that's what I call uh, inbound marketing versus outbound marketing. So if you can start a new company, do it with inbound, don't do it with outbound. Now, there's a couple things I really like about this inbound approach versus the traditional outbound approach. With inbound, your success is much more about the width of your brain than it is about the, width, uh, about the uh, width of your wallet. Big companies have a, lot, have a big, thick wallet and a really thin brain. Small companies have big brain, thin wallet. Inbound marketing is great for small businesses. So you people at HBS, I heard, I'm a Sloan guy, but I heard a rumor the HBS people have big brains. And so you guys should be all over this inbound marketing discuss because your success is much more about the width of your brain than the width of your wallet. You don't really need any money to be successful with inbound marketing. Second thing I like about inbound marketing is the way it scales. So let me, let me walk through how I think most venture-backed startup marketing departments work. Here's how it works. Everybody ready? You get your pile of, pile of venture capital. It's a pile. Sequoia Capital, they put all the venture in. And the marketing guy's like, great. Here's my plan. I got my shovel. Hold on. <laughs> shovel. And over here on the left, that, that's Google AdWords, uh, but it, it's really a furnace. So I got my shovel. And I shunk, I got all the money, and I throw it into Google's mouth. And Google grows like crazy. But you're stuck, and you can't grow, and it's really hard to get the math work with AdWords. And this is how a lot of startups try to get the math to work. It's AdWords and uh, Facebook ads. Just darn hard to make it work. If you get it to work, you put a dollar in the machine, you get like a dollar ten out of the machine. Really hard to get that math work. The way inbound marketing works is very different. Let's just say, let's just say you're the CEO of Ford Motor Company. And if you're CEO of Ford Motor Company, you've got assets on your balance sheet. What are some of the assets on your balance sheet? Ford Motor Company, assets on the balance sheet. Factories, inventory, cash, thank you, David, you're a very good student, um, things like that. Now, let's say you're VP of marketing or you're the founder of a startup, what are the marketing assets you've got? The vision. 
That's crap. Hard, tangible asset on your balance sheet if you're a marketer. Perspective. That's horseshit. Time, horseshit. Come on. Okay, let me, get, let me give you a hint. Links into your website. What's another one? HBS. Twitter handle. What? Is, what? Uh, like a Twitter handle. Twitter followers. Is that what you said? Brilliant. What else? Facebook fans, number of keywords you rank for in Google, number of uh, pages on your website. Those are hard, tangible, modern marketing assets on your marketing balance sheet. And what happens is you create an asset today, create a piece of content today, and it's, a, it's an asset that lasts forever and scales forever. It, it, it pulls in customers and it lasts forever and, and, it, and, and it pulls in customers essentially forever. So it's not like you're renting that asset. You own, you own this asset. You're not renting space on Google. You're not renting space in some list. You're not renting space on Facebook. You're creating your own marketing assets to become magnets that pull customers in. People with me? Guys with me? Cool. Okay, the other thing I like about inbound marketing versus outbound marketing is people hate outbound marketing. Does anyone like getting called at home at 6 o'clock? Does anyone like getting spam? Anyone like those television ads? Sucks. Inbound marketing is great. You create all this content, and it's rich content, and it's informative, and it pulls people in, and it's engaging. So people fall in love with your brand like they fall in love with Patagonia, or they fall in love with Apple, or they fall in love with Whole Foods, these brands that people love. That's you want to create a lovable, modern brand. People are really sick of this traditional marketing. Okay. And so how do you do inbound marketing? Well, we've got a couple minutes here, so I'm going to talk about part of it. The first thing you need to do as an inbound marketer is, is to create tons of content. The idea is you got to turn your website into a modern magnet by creating tons of remarkable content. Blog articles, genius, brilliant blog articles, um, ebooks, webinars, things like that. And if your blog article is good or your webinar is good or your ebook is good, it'll pull people in. And the better it is, the more retweets it'll get, the more Facebook likes it'll get, the more links it'll get, the longer it will sustain, the more leads it'll pull in, and it'll be really, really awesome. So the key to being a modern genius marketer, creating tons and tons of remarkable content. You market, you market today, think of yourself like Disney or Fox or CNN, like you're a production studio. So think of yourself like a production studio, turn your brains into customers. What's this? Who said that? You said that. What's your name? Beva, you're a goddamn genius. <laughs> that is the internet. What are the dots? Pages. Customers. They're pages. They're, we they're websites, OK? And the big white ones are big websites. What are, what, are the, what are the lines between the pages? Links. The more, the more links you have, the more visitors you'll get, the more authority you get, the more mojo you get. And the way I kind of think about it is links are to the internet as dollars and cents are to the economy. How do you get a lot of links into your website? Good content. Brilliant content. What's your name? Genius. Bill's a genius. Remarkable content. Here's, what you, here's what's going to happen. You're going to start your company, and your website's going to be like Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? It's like Cambridge, Mass. How many, how many airports in Cambridge? Zero. How many, how many like bus stations, real ones? None. Train stations. Highways. Eh, a couple, two highways. You want to turn your website from Cambridge, Massachusetts to New York City. How many, how many airports in New York City? Yeah, two, three whoppers, train stations. Yeah, you got Penn State, a lot of big train stations. How many bus stations? The bus stations are Twitter, the train stations are Facebook, uh, the airports are LinkedIn, the highways are links from other websites. So to be a remarkable, modern, great marketing people love that scales, you have to be able to create a lot of content. Anyone know what this is? This, I used to live in Japan. This is the Imperial Palace in Japan. And I took this, this picture because it reminds me of my favorite philosopher. My favorite philosopher is a guy named Warren Buffett. And what Warren Buffett says to his CEOs is you want to build a moat around your business. You want to build barrier to entry, uh, barriers around your business, like Michael was talking about. And the modern moat around your business, the way he says it, I really like. It's like you want to make the moat, make it really wide, make it cold, and put sharks in and alligators and wider and colder. 
I think the modern moat around your business, I totally agree with Michael, isn't a patent, isn't a trademark. It's this inbound marketing stuff. It's how many links into your site? How's that growing? How many keywords are you ranking for? How many Facebook fans? How many LinkedIn fans? How are you getting them converting down the funnel? That stuff's really hard to replicate. And it reminds me of a company that I really like uh, called Zappos. Um, when I think of Zappos, let's just say I wanted to start a company to compete with Zappos. And I was going to, you and I were going to start it. We're going to start it. We're going to, what's your name? Athletic. We're going to bury them. You and I were going to bury them. We could, we could figure out a lot. We could get the, a good looking website and hire a designer. We can even get their funky culture right. We could get the inventory. We could get the supply chain. The thing that's a bear for us to compete with is Tony Shea, the CEO. He's got 6 million Twitter followers. Their website's got 500,000 links into it. They're, they have 5 million keywords they rank for. That's a nearly insurmountable competitive advantage for the two of us to compete with. That's what I wish for you, an insurmountable competitive advantage. Go for inbound marketing really works. I don't know about you, but I feel like I need to rush out and buy something that he's selling. <laughs> Whatever it was, I'm buying. I'm in. Uh, too late, I think. I think a smarter brother got there earlier. Wait. Wait. If you want to learn more, the inbound marketing book, you can check out. Or go to HubspotMarketingGrader.com. You put your URL in there, and it will give you a grade of 1 to 100 on how good or bad you are at this stuff. <coughs> And then if you like this stuff, I teach a class at Sloan on it. It's a half semester class. You could cross register for it. That's you. Thank you very much. Yeah.